to uh, recording. Hello. Morning. Welcome, everyone. Hi. We'll watch Coconut on Dead. Hi. So once we get started, we're going to ask everybody to mute. <clears throat> but right now, if you want to say hi, I'm happy to see people. And most of the students and staff entering. Okay. Hello. Hi. Okay, well, we're going to just let people come on and um, we'll get started in a few seconds. Okay. Is everybody on? Okay, so um, could one of my co hosts mute everyone, please? Thank you. So welcome everyone to um, our speaker series for the, this is Chad of Bergen County. And we have a speaker the first Monday of every month, most months. Um, and we also have some support groups, but let me tell you what's coming up. Um, Ellen, you're, you're muted, Ellen. Okay. Hi, I don't know what you heard, but welcome um, to our uh, monthly speaker series. We have a speaker the first Monday of every month uh, from 8 to 9.15 p.m. Uh, and I just want to let you know what's coming up. Uh, we're very excited to have Deborah Goldberg with us tonight. And we have some other wonderful speakers, just so that you know, and maybe put it on your calendar on April 4th, um, Carolyn Lynch Parcells is going to be talking about ADHD medications, knowing and understanding what the choices are. She really gives a very understandable um, talk and it uh, can help you in terms of uh, uh, being a parent and making decisions. Then. May 2nd, um, it's kind of the opposite. You're in our pharmacy. Um, Monica Haskell is gonna talk about beyond drugs for ADHD and um, other things that we need to do for, um, for ADHD. In June, we're gonna have Audra Bursay, I think I, that's how you say it, um, who is a fantastic nutritionist. And she's gonna talk about ADHD and the relationship to food, which is a gigantic issue. And we're gonna to try to um, address some of the, the things that come up for people. Um, on September 12th, we're gonna have help, um, Anika Alstrom is gonna talk about helping ADHD families succeed with time. She has a whole very organized program. I think you, you're gonna like it. And on October 3rd, Roberto Oliver, Olivardia is going to talk about ADHD and sleep. So just before we get started, I just want you to know about what else we offer. Um, and everything is virtual these days. So we have um, an adult support group that meets the third Monday of each month from 7.30 to 8.30 with Isabel Ibrahim, Ibrahimi. And um, here's her contact. And then we have two parent support groups. One is for younger parents of younger kids from pre-k to sixth grade and that meets the second Wednesday of each month from 8 to 9 15 um, and for teens for seventh graders and up uh, we have a support group the fourth Wednesday of each month and that's also from 8 to 9 15 and Joni Korn runs that if you have any questions um, you can feel free to contact me at adhd.bergencounty at gmail.com. And um, we have all this information, uh, which is chad.net slash chapter slash 545. I always just Google Bergen County Chad. So um, 
with no further ado, oh, now I can see everybody. Hi, I couldn't see you all before. This is so nice. Um, so Deborah Goldberg, now I know Deborah for years because she was she's an OT and I work with kids, or used to. Um, and so we have worked together um, in schools, out of schools, with eating issues, with behavior issues. Um, and I have so much respect for her. Uh, she's worked over 25 years um, in a wide variety of public and private settings. And um, she most recently started, it's not so recent anymore, Deborah, it's about four years, three years, um, her own private practice. Um, and what she said was she wanted to fulfill her passionate vision of providing comprehensive and sincere care for children in collaboration with their parents and teachers to affect real and lasting functional change. And I have to say, knowing her, that the sincerity is sincere. I don't know how else to say it. Okay, so with no further ado, Deborah, welcome. We're delighted to have you and take over the screen now, or whatever you, whatever you need to do with the screen. Oh, wait, one more thing. Let me just say, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We will leave a nice chunk of time at the end so that um, Deborah can answer the questions. But we, if you stop in the middle, it oftentimes um, just disrupts the flow. So when you have a thought, put it in the chat and we'll try to get to all the questions at the end. Okay. And please interrupt me if there are some IT issues that are, that's glitchy, yeah, there, please. Well, <laughs> it's not my strong suit. Okay, so hi everybody. I wish I could see all of you, but I can't. Um, I'm reading my notes, but uh, thank you so much for registering tonight. And I really hope to make the next hour so interesting and practical so that you have a better understanding of what might be underlying certain behaviors that you have or your children have and how you can get yourself or your family to a better place. Um, just a special thank you again to the chat professionals and the coordinators who invited me here to speak with you tonight. I'm really excited to be here and I'm so excited that there's such an interest in this topic um, and that Chad has created this supportive space for all of you to share this information and network together. So let's start. Um, here. So the presentation tonight is going to offer an approach to help understanding sensory processing and self-regulation and how it's manifested. And then we're going to tie it into ADHD. So I'm going to describe first some sensory related behaviors, three types of children, the sensory over responder, the sensory under responder, and the sensory craver. And then I'll suggest some effective strategies to help manage these behaviors in the context of their environment. And then next we'll discuss the relationship between sensory processing disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And then there'll be time for questions and answers. Okay, so here as a basic review, here are our senses. Many of you will recognize five of them, but there are actually eight. Um, we can't see. Yeah, we can't see your screen. screen. You have to share your screen. I'm sharing. I'm sharing. I'm still sharing. It's, what do you see? We don't see your screen yet. Nothing. Hold on. So that's that's a problem. Why do you stop sharing and then try sharing again? I don't see the share button. Uh, it should be on the bottom. It's the green button on the bottom. Mm -mm. There isn't. There isn't. There's no button here. Let me see. No. There's no button on the bottom. Rachel? Um, Deborah, can you send this slide to one of us and we can share it? Mm -hmm. Let me see. Share screen. Hold on. How's 
that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You got it. Yes, perfect. Okay. All right, where do we leave off? Okay, so we, did you see the slide of the presentation of, the, of this? Nope, now we see it. Okay, so like I said before, I'm going to be going through the sensory modulation subtypes. There's the sensory over responder, the sensory under responder, and the sensory craver. We'll go over some strategies that have been effective um, in experience and based on research. And then I'll talk about the relationship between sensory processing disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And sorry about that uh, glitch. Okay, so many of us recognize five of these senses, but there are actually eight senses that we all have. Um, we're familiar with vision, with auditory, with olfactory, tactile, which is our touch, olfactory is our smell, gustatory is our uh, sense of taste. Um, and the other three, one is vestibular, which is what helps us sense our movement and where we are in space. And proprioception does the same thing, but our receptors are more related to our muscles and our, um, our where our body uh, and arms and extremities can feel and be um, in space, as opposed to vestibular imbalance. And then the last one, interoception, is the sense of how we feel on the inside, our sense of hunger, our sense of fatigue, or needing to use, when our bladder is full, needing to use the bathroom. So those are our eight senses, and we are going to go over those in the context of sensory modulation tonight. So I'd like tonight to come away, I'd like for all of you to come away tonight learning or getting a better understanding of how we all have certain degrees of sensitivity when we are exposed to a single or a simultaneous sensory experience. And depending on how our brain interprets that information, we respond accordingly. So our reactions can be typical or atypical or perhaps even so extreme that they can impair our daily functioning and routine. For example, um, on any day, we may need to adjust the volume on our TV screens because at that moment, we, per we perceive it as too loud or too muted, or um, two of us could be sitting right next to each other in a room and one of us feels very cold and wants to raise the heat and the other one feel is feeling just right. So how do we react when we are exposed to various sensory experiences? Let's go over some of these scenarios and audience, note the level when you draw the line, when a particular experience feels overwhelming or it simply feels insufficient or not enough or you needing more to respond. So take hugs. How do you feel being hugged? Do you wanna feel, do you wanna pull away from it? Um, and it gives you kind of like a heebie-jeebies or do you want to be held tighter? Scented candles, I am reminded of this every time I go into the mall and I pass by a Yankee candle store. Does that smell invite you into the store or do you want to hold your breath until you pass that store? Um, spoiled milk, some people can taste it, swallow it and determine whether it's spoiled or not and other people can taste it spit it right out or gag. Um, these are all different, uh, different uh, levels of sensitivity that we all experience. Um, fireworks, are you the one um, going to the fireworks carrying the lawn chairs or are you the one carrying the earplugs? And are you prepared for what's coming next? And same thing with whispers and loud noises. Uh, if someone is whispering or someone is, if there's loud music, how are you responding to that? Do you get frustrated? Um, does it make you comfortable or uncomfortable? So these scenarios or situations really um, are trying to, I'm trying to illustrate here how we can have, we all have different reactions and we handle each situation in our own ways. Um, we can stay in that particular setting or context and environment or it becomes so unmanageable that we need to leave, or I need to leave, or I, you know, I have to drag myself out of, from a crowd. Um, if you don't, if you do feel uncomfortable, how much can you adjust your reaction before you cross that threshold of being inappropriate? 
and we'll see how this is relevant in a minute. So I'm first going to explain sensory, what sensory modulation is. And I put in regulation here because very often in this presentation, they're used interchangeably because sensory modul modulation is really talking about the ability to regulate and adjust our reactions to the sensations around us. Um, some notes about sensory modulation. Regulation develops over time and with experience. So early on in life, young children don't have the ability or the experience to calm themselves, and they're dependent on others to soothe them. Our parents hug us and hold us, or we give our children advice on what to do when they're experiencing something uncomfortable. But over time, with this experience, children learn from others and their environment and their mistakes how they can self-regulate. And they learn what helps them, and then they can apply it themselves over time. Our ability to self-regulate and how we react will depend on how familiar the experience may be, how many senses we may be experiencing at the same time, how tired we are at the moment, how hungry we are um, at the moment. And to further complicate things, we have different reactivity thresholds for each separate sense. So that may mean that I can be super sensitive and stay away from a ticklish touch and loud music, but I, at the same time, I can love the intensity, the intensity of a zip line experience or being hugged tightly. Um, when there is a glitch in this chain of sensory modulation, meaning that when people, adults, children, anyone, can't regulate this intensity or the duration or the nature of their response, that can lead to considerable and significant problems in their daily function and, then, and their routine. So we're gonna start with the first sensory subtype called the, what I'm calling the hyper or over responder. This is, uh, the over responder is, shows a predisposition to responding too much or too soon or for too long to the same sensory stimuli that most people might find quite tolerable. So individuals with sensory over-responsivity are more sensitive to sensory stimulation than most people. Their bodies feel sensation too easily or too intensely. The sensory input that someone is getting is just too sensitive and everything just feels too much or too overwhelming. We would characterize these people as avoiders, meaning they go out of their way to avoid sensory stimulation. They may cover their ears, close their eyes, or run away. Sensory overload can cause a reaction that tells our brain we are in danger. Whoops, we are in danger. And that, uh, and when we have, and when we feel that we're in danger, we go into a survival mode that. Um, that some people uh, describe as the fright, fight, or flight response to sensation. And in those situations, we may impulsively react, run away, get physical or aggressive verbally, um, or we may shut down. And by doing so, we are really minimizing all the sensations. Um, and by you know, leaving someplace um, either abruptly or more subtly, um, those are ways that we can avoid um, these situations and that feeling of being overwhelmed. Okay, so in a social situation, an innocent tap is misconstrued as a shove and that triggers an exaggerated reaction. That's typical in a classroom for or someone online. Um, they're waiting to go someplace, they get brushed on the side in the crowd of uh, in the classroom crowd and they punch back thinking that they were punched first. Um, that's, that's a big one in schools. Um, food smells or textures feel overwhelming. Those are our picky eaters. Uh, people feel picky with clothing, um, textures, tags, seams, the sleeve length, and finally, sound, people are distracted by some ambient noise, making it difficult to stay focused. 
Um, there are many people I see, I'm sure I do the same thing. Sometimes I'll be in a mode where I'll be hearing someone's cell phone when I'm trying to study or um, a toilet flush can make uh, someone uh, distracted or they can lose their focus from a barking dog outside. So some examples. Socially, the way this is manifested is that these individuals are rigid, they're inflexible or controlling or withdrawn. They're intense and they can be demanding and hard to calm down and they have difficulty making friends. And the reason for all of this socially, um, these social repercussions is because many kids who feel overwhelmed need to stay in control so that things are predictable for them. And if once something is not predictable, then they are incredibly vulnerable and they're leaving themselves open to any sort of exaggerated response or reaction. So people who are hyper responders tend to have a more of a controlling um, disposition so they can all those controlling behaviors so they can manage their world around them without being too dysfunctional. Um, I just here want to stop it for a moment and clarify that there is a difference between disorders and sensitivities. And that difference is the intensity and the level of function. We all have our sensitivities and our thresholds to sound and touch and smells, et cetera. And that can range from really low to really high, like I showed or I, I tried to describe before. Depending on what our threshold is for any of these senses, our reaction can range from an extreme exaggerated response to no response at all. So for example, I can't stand the, the touch of raw meat when I'm making meatballs. So instead, I, don't, I wouldn't consider that a dysfunction because I don't avoid making meatballs um, or I don't and I'll eat meatballs and I won't associate meatballs with anything negative. But what I do instead is I put on gloves when I'm making them and I'll prepare raw food with gloves um, because not of the, not necessarily because of the health or safety of the bacteria and stuff like that. I'm more, of course, I'm talking about the texture right now. Um, I'm sensitive to the texture. So that's a sensitivity. It's not a disorder. So when you can cope and manage your sensitivity without disturbing your lifestyle, that's what I would call sensitivity. If this was a disorder, then my, my response would be far more extreme. So when you have an over-responder, here are some ideas that you can try, um, depending on the sense that's feeling overwhelmed. You can offer more comfortable clothing options, tagless, seamless, soft cotton or form-fitting clothes. You can create a room in your house or in their own room that is soothing. So when they do feel overwhelmed and they do feel this feeling of dysregulated, they can soothe themselves with these yogi bow cushions. They're basically bean bags, cozy blankets, weighted blankets, um, fish aquarium, those lava lamps. Um, they have now these uh, on Amazon, these uh, projector uh, laser lights that um, I use in my clinic where um, it sort of kind of projects the um, northern lights and kids could just look up and they start to feel relaxed um, and it distracts them from their feeling of being overwhelmed. Um, noise canceling headphones and white noise machines mutes out that overwhelming um, sense of sound that they might be experiencing. Uh, maintaining a clean, a neat room, distracting posters are put aside, um, knickknacks are kept to a minimum, again, to have a little bit more organization in their lives and not, not be as distracted and overwhelmed and, um, you know, and, and uh, they'll be able to feel a little bit more regulated without the chaos, the, the environmental chaos. Um, sunglasses help reduce the glare. Some people are sensitive to, um, to light. And last, the calendars, scheduling and previewing are ideas for people who, again, are the ones who really 
thrive on routine and predictability because when something is unpredictable for them or um, it catches them off guard, they might experience that sensory sensation, that feeling as overwhelming and throwing them off. The more that is predictable in their lives through calendars, through visual schedules, what, what, uh, knowing what comes next, that's better for them. Um, I think that you know, there might be many of you who felt a sense of relief when my second slide showed the format of tonight's presentation, knowing that you know this is going to be a certain, a certain time, this is what we're going to be covering, and um, your expectations are going to be met. So that's an example of how, um, how we can manage some of the, uh, the behavior and responses of an over responder. All right, our next category, our next subtype is the hypo under responder. This child, circle there and many others, they are extremely under aroused. They're lethargic and they're withdrawn. They lack awareness to their body senses. They have and produce a reduced or slowed reaction to their environmental sensory demands. The picture on the previous page is a student who literally is facing the opposite direction as his peers in his class while the teacher is facing, uh, while the teacher is, is giving a lesson. The um, responses are muted very often. These children or these individuals are disengaged and they have a high threshold for registering and processing information um, and they can tolerate pain and temperature. These are kids who can, you know, hold when, when I'm baking with uh, when I'm baking with some of these kids, especially this time of year. Um, and we when cookies come out of the oven, some kids can just grab the cookie and walk out and show their mom. And other ones are are blowing and waiting and holding on a, on a plate and and you know it has to be outside for ten minutes before they can even touch it. So um, the under responder is the type of person that will just grab the cookie and walk out and the pain, the temperature, the heat um, of the cookie doesn't seem to bother them. All right, these, these individuals also don't realize that they could be in a dangerous situation because they, they're, they're experiencing what might be something unsafe as a very muted response. They might have a very muted response to something that's unsafe. So um, that could be a dangerous situation. Um, they need help finding objects that are more obvious to others. They are generally disorganized and they are disheveled looking. The, their buttons are misaligned. Um, their clothes are worn backwards. Their pants are inside out. Uh, some of them are not even aware that they're drooling. They're oblivious to food on their faces. Um, like you could take these are the kids and people you could tell exactly what they had for lunch that day, three hours later, because it's on their face still. And um, they also need repeated reminders and prompting to keep them going um, and to complete tasks. So I split this part up um, by age. So this might um, be helpful for the, the audience that we have uh, who's listening right now. Um, for younger children, some ideas and strategies that you might want to incorporate are putting your child on your lap and bouncing them to keeping them alert. Um, all of these that we're going to be, all these strategies, the key point here is that we want to in, just alert them more, keep them more aroused and stimulated. So that's what these all, all these strategies have in common. So some outdoor activities that can be arousing are swinging, spinning in circles, monkey bars, chin-ups, crab walks, animal walks, uh, leapfrogs, marching, jumping, and water toys and games that involve splashing um, is, can be very, very stimulating and can wake these kids up. Um, arousing indoor activities can include wall push-ups, jumping jacks, uh, a popcorn game, which uh, many teachers use, uh, which is basically you have, uh, you could have your, your kids uh, sit in a chair, hold on to the arms of the chair and try to pick themselves up and push themselves up with their, using the weight of their hands. Um, you could do this um, 
on the base of the chair or on the chair arms. And uh, if you do this a number of times, it certainly activ activates their energy level. Um, the, um, sometimes we'll, uh, we'll play games of pushing at the walls, um, try, to, or try to make the room bigger and put your hands on the walls and to push out, uh, cleaning tables with a large sponge or moving furniture. And then of course, there are social based games that involve movement as well, which are really incorporate the movement um, stimulation, as well as involving more children and peers, not just from a social point of view, but also from a sensory point of view, um, in terms of it creates more noise, there's more visual stimulation. So just the fact of, um, of in incorporating a social environment that can also just lead to more alertness and arousal. So some of those games I, I uh, highlighted here were you know, red light, green light, Simon Says, or Tag. Okay, for older children, Beat the Clock is awesome. This works so well with, um, with older kids. And I'm gonna say older kids are um, anywhere from you know, first grade and up uh, where whatever, they need to do, you set a time or you set a stopwatch, they press the stopwatch button go, and they always want to try to beat their time or beat their friend's time. And it definitely, that concept and just that idea is really seems to be stimulating and arousing for them. Turn-taking games is another idea. And then there are seating modifications that you can use. There are cushions that are filled with air. Um, and sometimes they have little bumps on them. There's one brand called Discosit. Um, there are other ones that are um, filled with sand um, and they have a weighted, more of a weighted feel to them. And, um, or they are, there are ones that are more, um, you could inflate them or deflate them depending on how much stability you want. So those can be um, pretty much adjusted to your comfort level. Uh, TheraBand, the picture that you see on the screen, the TheraBand is um, something that basically it's a gigantic rubber band that goes around the legs of the chair and people use that for to keep them alert and stimulated very often in class. Uh, students use these um, to press against, to pull against, um, to keep them alert. And also um, I wanted to recommend a standing desk that there are some kids or adults uh, that perform better when they're standing and they seem to be more alert and engaged while they're standing. And I'm seeing a lot more of those on the market, um, main, like a mainstream market being sold today. And for any age, any age, if you're animated and you raise that level of tone and you have more uh, exaggerated gestures, people attend more and people are responsive more. So that's always a great um, skill, to, uh, skill to have and it's a great technique to use. Um, color systems, labels uh, that also can alert kids to help them be more aware of um, how to organize and what, to, um, you know, what belongs where. Um, and it doesn't seem just to all fall into this general abyss teaching verbal self-cueing, repeating directions is a great way to help reinforce the various senses in your system. Here, the verbal cueing is stimulating the hearing system. And that's just another direction, another way that you can um, arouse your sensory system to be more alert by using both of those. Um, Sports bottle cap drinks that encourages sucking, um, that also is alerting. And then of course, upbeat music, musical activities, um, anything with that relates to sound or rhythm or um, you know, any, anything uh, some kids like to, uh, like to study for tests with music. I don't understand that, but there are, I they're passed by my kids who have finals um, and they're, there's wrapped m and you know, blasting in their room. I don't understand, but for that particular child, that's what's stimulating and that's what helps them get the job done. Okay, the third category, our last category is the sensory craver. And the sensory craver is driven to actively obtain sensory stimulation, but getting the stimulation 
they need just only results in more disorganization and it doesn't satisfy their drive for more and their need for more. So these unsatiated seekers try to seek out more and more stimulation um, through intensity and extreme behavior. Um, usually it's excessive. And the more they try to feed their intensity, they feed their, this need, the more disorganized they get. So if we take this apart and by, by senses, so here visually, uh, these kids or adults may crave flashing lights or spinning objects and they're, you know, they, they can't pull themselves away from looking at a, a screen or a, a video game or, or um, anything uh, that, that is going to feel or seem exciting to them visually. Auditory from a sound point of view, they use a loud voice. Sometimes they have to make background noises themselves as uh, you know, clicking or humming. Um, they need that, that sense. They need to feel, it helps them feel awake, alert, um, and they love to be in noisy places. In terms of taste, kids or adults lick or chew non-food objects. I'm wondering how many of you are right now watching this um, with one ear and chewing on, you know, eating your snack at the same time or chewing on a pen. Um, that is very common. Um, people biting on objects. Some people smell like the smell of others, and that is intense. Uh, uh, that can feel intense, or they want to make it feel uh, intense for themselves. Um, and sometimes people prefer one type of food and enjoy it at its greatest intensity level uh, very spicy, or very, very sour, or sweet. Um, vestibular, meaning against balance and movement, those are people who constantly like to spin constantly moving, they want to swing, they're engaged in fast activities, they're runners and bikers, uh, they love to ski, they're on the roller coasters, and uh, these are the kids who you could throw up in the air and catch them, spin them around, and they are happy and they never want you to stop. And uh, for the proprioception, which is the sense of where your body is in space and the sense of of um, if you you knowing whether your um, arm is up or down or where or how much to gauge um, movement of how much to gauge where how much you have to reach for something um, that sense that's called pro proprioception that um, sometimes that is manifested in obsessive jumping uh, loving that feeling of crashing pushing into things leaning on people dragging yourself on somebody. Um, loving that leggings sort of tight feel under armor, um, loving the weighted vest or the weighted blanket, and sometimes even grinding your teeth. And finally, in the touch sensation, that category, those are people who, the people who love and seek the sensation of touch seem, are un they're unable to uh, control what they touch, they want to touch if something is is fuzzy or something seems, um, you know, just you know has just has some sort of uh, texture that they are attracted to. They really can't stop the impulse and um, and avoid or or stop touching it. They're going to keep impulsively going right for it. Um, they feel textures wherever they go. They have their hands on the walls. Um, they play with messy objects for much longer duration than other kids or adults and um, on bites and mounts objects, not for the same reason as the taste, but in this case, it's more to seek, not to seek out the taste or the flavor, but here it's to seek out the, the touch, the, the pressure of, um, of that experience. All right, so for sensory seekers, here are some strategies that you may want to try. So 
There's creating, organ uh, creating an organized movement experience that is goal-directed and purposeful. And it's important here to know that children who are the sensory cravers, they're trying to obtain so much input that they themselves are putting themselves in an over-arousing situation. So for all of these strategies, the key is to provide alerting and arousing and stimulating activities and experiences but they really, really need to be goal oriented and purposeful and organizing so that they don't go over the, you know, over the deep end or over the cliff, off the deep end um, with this. It has to be provided in a way that the effect is a positive one and that it doesn't go off and enable overstimulation. And sometimes, um, as a clinician, I see this um, in schools when, when teachers feel that you know, many of their students really need that break, they're feeling overstimulated, so they go out and they um, let them run around for recess. And that, for a typical kid, that may work, but for someone who's a sensory seeker, all that running around without a purpose um, and just to run um, will in fact increase their arousal level and they're gonna come back to class even more aroused and overstimulated and not as controlled as the teacher was hoping that person would be. So um, you would want to use, um, oops, sorry, hold on. Okay, you'd want to use um, intermittent, varied, or interrupted in vestibular input, meaning um, if you have someone um, on a, who likes swings, you might want to provide the swinging or spinning sensation um, to this sensory craver and increase his arousal level. But um, you're going to want to do that in a way that um, you're only going to swing him for a certain amount of repetitions and then guide that person to pick up uh, an object and then place it in the container then go come back on the swing. Let's go another round of five and then come off, pick up something else and put that into a container. The idea is really to, um, to give the child what they're looking for in, in terms of that sensory crave, but pair it with an organized, an organized task or a game. Okay, so now what I'd like to focus on is the all what we were talking, everything that we've been talking about thus far, this SPD, the sensory processing disorder, and the ADHD connection. So there are many behaviors that we experience as individuals or we see in our children that seem extremely similar to each other. They really, you know, we're not sure whether this is SPD, we're not sure if this is ADHD they seem to kind of run along the same lines. And some of those uh, behaviors are um, that impulsivity, um, these kids or these adults, um, and maybe even ourselves, we feel impulsive, we're distracted, or sometimes we're over-focused on something, we're forgetful or restless. Uh, we can't finish a task and we can become aggressive and we have difficulty relating to friends in some social situations. So these really overlap, these behaviors and, and characteristics really overlap between the two, but they are in fact two separate issues and two separate disorders and I'm gonna go into that right now. So first I'm going to, I'm gonna brush over this pretty quickly, this slide because it's a little technical, but um, the causes of sensory processing disorder and ADHD are different. Um, ADHD is more related to neurotransmitters and there's just not enough um, neurotransmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine, norepinephrine in, your, uh, in your body. Um, and it's, and uh, there are structural abnormal, abnormalities in your brain um, that relate to executive function um, in the front part of your brain. Uh, the sensory processing disorder really seems, according to the research, seems to be that the issues 
are in a different part of the, the brain and it's more related to not the that the electrical impulses between neurons to, to pass the message along um, from your sensory receptors to your brain where it's interpreting what the information is those are faulty so um, we're not responding as accurately as we should be so here are some signs and symptoms that differ and i wanted to bring this to your attention so people with ADHD and SPD often say that they can't shut off their brain. Um, but, and I went through those similarities, but here I'm illustrating that SPD is different. Um, the per, in SPD, the brain is not correctly dealing with the information that's coming in from their senses. Um, and the detection, when they're detecting this incoming sensory information and interpreting it with in their brain that becomes faulty and then we that that person requires gradual exposure or sensory desensitization to help them with their daily function they the people with ADHD is the the focus is more about whoops sorry the focus is more about focus and controlling impulsive behaviors so a child with ADHD may have learning issues or be gifted. They can't sit still and they may be on the go and they might daydream a lot or forget or lose <laughs> things or talk too much, but they're not, it's not related necessarily to what's going on in their sensory world. Um, other points here that you're reading um, are that some kids they can um, with ADHD can um, improve and calm uh, they can improve their attention and calm when there's some novelty um, and actually with kids with AB, ADHD is they crave they crave this novelty and that actually can disorganize them more 40 percent and I will get to this um, here excuse me 40 percent of children who have ADHD also have SPD, and that's a pretty strong number. The interesting fact here is that, you know, right for the simplicity of this presentation, there, you know, it's nice to distinguish between a clean ADHD diagnosis and a clean SPD or sensory processing disorder diagnosis. But very often, you can have both. And here, 40%, there are many, many cases um, and many research articles that describe this as an overlapping, sim uh, over overlapping or comorbidity um, symptom that, uh, that these people can interpret, that these people can experience. So we have to be mindful of that. And in terms of treatment, that's also very different. So when you have someone who's diagnosed with ADHD, medication is helpful with balancing out those insufficiencies with the neurotransmitters and improving your attention and focus. Um, for someone with ADHD, more of a behavioral management is used as an approach to dealing with the deficits of executive functioning self-control and self-esteem. For example, many people apply cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, the primary providers dealing and treating ADHD are usually physicians and mental health providers. And parents, of course, have to play a big role and follow through at home. On the other hand, for children who have the sensory processing disorder, they're, they're treated by an occupational therapist who is sensory integrated us uh, who has who has training in sensory integration um, and the idea here is to have them participate actively in specific graded and meaningful sensory rich activities and when you use and the more that these are applicable to your lifestyle and function and the more they're integrated into your life as regular you know built in um, you know, have them uh, engage in activities that they would normally be doing, but just more 
you know, focus on the uh, sensory aspects of those activities. Uh, that is really the approach of what an occupational therapist may do with them. Um, again, it's sensory based. It aims to improve the neurological connections that allow for more accurate sensory processing and appropriate responses. So I wrote here in my notes about brushing um, that, you know, if anyone is familiar with a brushing technique um, that some, uh, some occupational therapists use, that is to help treat um, uh, individuals that are sensitive to light touch. And um, basically it's a surgical brush that you, you basically brush deeply and heavily on your body with and so enough so that the bristles are bending. Um, and that deep, um, that, that deep sense of, uh, of touch is trying to mute out the feelings of the noxious light touch that someone might be experiencing. So that's just an example of, uh, of a way how an occupational therapist might use um, a modality to help, um, help people start to improve their tolerance level and their ability to manage different sensory experiences. And again, of course, parents have to play a big role in this area as well. Okay. Um, to finish up here, I don't know what those lines are on the screen. I apologize, but oh, there they go. I don't know what happened, but um, anyway, I just wanted to reiterate that these suggestions that I would made tonight are not one size fits all. Um, they definitely need trial and error tweaking in terms of the complexity, what is being asked of them, the timing, the environmental context, and of course, use them as, um, as they should be age appropriate and socially acceptable. One strategy may not be you may not be apl applicable to um, someone of an older age and expect a learning curve. Uh, many times I find that someone might want to try these. They're eager to try the strategy. They'll try it one or two times and say, oh, it's not working. But please give it a chance. Give it some time and assess what's going on and look at the world around them. Look at the context. Look at why and maybe even try to um, get an idea of why something may be working or may not be working. If you have any questions, of course, you can call your OT. Um, many children benefit from OT, uh, the occupational therapy intervention. Um, in addition to some of what uh, I suggested tonight, um, so, they can, so they can build and, uh, and learn and, and parents can be educated on how to um, develop these, these coping strategies using different strategy, different, using this, these different sensory integrative strategies. And finally, I just wanted to reiterate as Chad does that you're not alone here. Um, as you see, there are many people who are experiencing this. We all do to a certain, to a certain degree. And you really should be taking advantage of these support groups and the professionals that are out there to help identify what is going on, make some more sense out of it, um, network with people and feel supported that you have a community that can you can all relate and, and, um, and, and speak to about this. So um, that's what I've got for you tonight. And here are some of the references I used. And finally, thank you again for participating. And it was a pleasure speaking with you tonight. Oh, Deborah, you're this was great. And your timing was absolutely perfect. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions. Um, so I'm going to go through some of them. Uh, for those of you who I, whose questions I skip, please excuse me. Um, somebody, Rachel actually asked, how does one know when you can stop going to OT. Okay, so that's a great question. As an OT, never. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> so, oh, I, someone asked me to stop sharing the screen. Um, I would love to know how to do that. Hold on. Stop share. Oh, 
now we can see you and your beautiful face. Okay, terrific. Now. Okay, great. So um, the question was, how do we know when to stop OT? How do you know when a kid's ready or when they like, you know, it's not going to benefit them any anymore? Like they've kind I mean, of there's a, there's a caveat to this question. So uh, the OT said that the kid graduated from OT and then the kid was completely dysregulated and behavior issues began at home. Um, so if an OT says, oh, you've graduated from OT, then what is a family meant to do? Okay, well, that that's a good question. And, you know, obviously, I don't know the specifics of this particular case. But what that OT may be saying is that in her repertoire of knowledge and experience and strategies from a sensory point of view, there is she's kind of, or he may have hit the limits. Um, in terms of maybe this child is just now plateauing in terms of the the intervention that he or she is providing to them. Um, it also can be a sign that the sensory integration strategies that are being used are not working and the child is not being responsive to them because it's not in fact a sensory processing issue. Um, it could be like uh, we were saying before, it could be an issue of ADHD. And those the strategies that you would help um, alleviate the symptoms of sensory processing disorder are not the same as they would be with ADHD. So in this particular case, it might be that the occupational therapist exhausted the techniques or strategies that she would or he would use for a, uh, for a child who presented as someone with sensory processing disorder. And perhaps it it's not that, and maybe it's something more than that. And um, I would suggest maybe um, going to a neurologist at this point. Uh, could I just throw in another piece? You know, OTs who do, uh, who provide services at school have, are much more limited in terms of what they have available and they're not all trained in sensory integration. So um, it may be, as Deborah said, you know, based on the OTs, repertoire, um, which may not um, really be as broad or the um, whatever the contract they have is they have with the school. All right. Okay. Let me, I also uh, I'm also just going to add here too is that I find in my own practice that, you know, when the kids are younger, and these characteristics, these behavior characteristics seems seem to blur and um, they ADHD and sensory processing disorder look can look similar. Um, strategies can change. So initially, I might use these sensory strategies like we discussed today. But um, once an ADHD diagnosis has been confirmed, um, sometimes my strategy will shift to more of a how are we going to manage and cope with this and focus more on the executive function aspects um, rather than build upon um, the, 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 the foundational senses um, and working on what may or may not be dysfunctional about how you're interpreting a certain sensation, but rather more from a top-down approach of, okay, we're looking at somebody who now can't organize himself or can't remember how to do things? What are some strategies and how can we compensate for these symptoms of ADHD? So OTs can use those, those tricks instead of, um, of their basic sensory integration training. Thanks. So let me get to some of these other questions. Um, what about kids that won't wear underwear or undershirts? Uh, Samantha wants to know, how do we get them to wear them again? Okay. Um, again, I would say that in these cases, it's going to be a matter of desensitization. I'm assuming that what Samantha is trying to say or express is that their child is overreactive to that, that feeling of wearing something so close to their body. 
um, it might feel, maybe the industry might feel a little too loose on them and uncomfortable. You might want to experiment and try with tighter fitting clothes, um, or maybe those undershirts and underwear are too tight. You might want to, want to try with looser fitting clothes. Try to find out and from your child what is what exactly is going on and how best he can describe it. Um, and in that case, we can also just really, in a very gradual way, de help desensitize them. So before putting on their um, their shirt or their underwear, you might want to take a towel and or give them a washcloth and have them rub their body, rub their chest, and you could rub their back to desensitize some of those sensory receptors so that they'll accept and be more um, more used to you know um, something else coming on them so it just it's it just a basic idea of desensitizing somebody thank you um can you so so avram asks can you please tell us more about sensory based anxiety and how it manifests in the classroom boy are we seeing a lot of that these days <laughs> um you know since very you know, since COVID, there's certainly been a spike of kids in my experience who are presenting with a lot of anxiety. And the question as an occupational therapist, as a professional for me, is always to stop first and ask, is this anxiety this is this anxiety or, or this anxiety-based behavior related to emotions or is it relating to a response to the sensory world around them or their senses. Uh, that's where I first start because as occupational therapists, we are trained really to deal with the anxiety that's based on you know, more sensory related issues. Um, but because some of the anxiety can be stemming from a completely different cause, an emotional issue, a psychological issue, any sensory based intervention that we may provide is not going to be you know, hitting it right on the head um, that they would need another professional to help them with that. So first, you definitely want to make sure that you are addressing the right problem for the right etiology with the right etiology. So Brad asks a related question. Um, he says, what would you advise for an over responder who is now having major anxiety about seeing other kids now not wearing a mask? And so this youngster is hiding under his desk and flighting to get away. The school is asking what they can do. And um, Brad said to make sure the other kids wear their masks, but you know, if only we could control everything. Um, so I wonder if you have a response or a way for Brad to think about um, the situation. Um, in this case, I really am not quite sure whether this is a sensory related, um, anxiety related behavior. Um, if I'm understanding you correctly, Ellen, it sounds like he's getting anxious that other people are not wearing masks when they should be. Um, I would delve into that and investigate a little bit more. Um, what is, you know, what is it about that as an occupational therapist? Maybe it's seeing more face than he's used to seeing after two years. Um, and that would be a visual component. But it could be truly, and I've seen this often, a psychological issue where they do feel that their health is being compromised and their safety is being compromised, and that would be directed to it for a different professional. Thank you. So um, Kristen has a seven and a half year old son. He says she says he makes a lot of noises like sound effects, trying to steer him away, and she's trying to steer him away from it when it gets really loud, but. Do you have any recommendations for managing the noises and the sound effects that he's making? Um, well, when I see or you know when I see that or hear about that from parents, my first question I ask is, what's the purpose? Um, is he doing this to stimulate himself and keep himself awake um, and alert, or is he using those sounds to drown out other noises that are in his environment that are too, or that feel or sound too obnoxious to him? So what we need to do is just take a step back for a minute, look at the context and see, is there a pattern 
Um, when do you find him doing this more often? Is the environment more stimulating and that's when he's doing this? Or is it more of an understimulating environment and that's when he's doing it? Then you might get more information. Um, in either case, he is providing himself with some coping mechanism. Um, again, you have to know what you're looking for um, and what the, you know, why he's responding this way. But if it's in a socially appropriate context, then, and it makes sense, then that's an effective use of his, you know, coping strategies at that point at, for, for that. It depends on how old this child is also, obviously. Seven and a half. But in a, you know, if it's not socially appropriate, then, you know, you might want to take the, um, you know, make, take a different approach and use some more cognitive awareness um, and point it out to him, talk about social appropriateness or give him an alternative, um, something that if he is seeking stimulation, then maybe you can give him something that will, you know, headphones, um, that he can hear some something that uh, that won't disturb other people or looks more socially appropriate. Thank you. I'm, I'm just looking. We have so many people who are sharing their own experiences as well as having questions. Um, so I'm trying to get to the questions. Um, so this is a, let's see. Um, are pediatricians generally, this is Nechama, uh, she asks, uh, are pediatricians generally aware of SPD before jumping to an ADHD diagnosis? That's a, I, I'm curious about your answer also. Okay. <laughs> so I will start by saying that ADHD is an accepted diagnosis that is recorded in the DSM-5 the Diagnostic Statistical Manual that lists all the uh, you know, disorders. SPD is not listed in there as, and it's not recognized as a specific uh, diagnosis on its own. Um, there is too much research out there right now that shows that there are many, that the symptoms of SPD overlap tremendously with symptoms of ADHD, of anxiety, of, um, of autism. So the, um, so this has not been an accepted independent disorder. So that's number one. Number two, it's recognized that it's, that there are symptoms, but it's not recognized as a disorder. Um, that's number one. Number two is that Many pediatricians who are educated and who have good relationships with occupational therapists, those are the ones that have a broader perspective on this and those, and that can vary obviously. So the doctors that I work with and deal with um, very often refer their um, patients to me um, because they understand what this, what this is. Um, I will also say that referring somebody for intervention for sensory processing difficulties or disorder is much more uh, likely to happen when the child is younger and the presentation is not as um, academic or it doesn't seem to interfere in um, other other functioning other than this kind of sensory modulation um, and their, their ability to, to soothe themselves or control themselves. Um, so they are more apt to, to address this modulation aspect before they do ADHD um, and the other symptoms related to their executive function and, dis and organization skills. Um, which usually kind of break off and you could pr pretty much um, uh, see those differences as they start to uh, enter lower school. So they don't necessarily jump to uh, the ADHD diagnosis in my experience, but then again, I'm biased because I'm working with doctors who um, are, are familiar and are uh, 
and have seen a lot of issues with sensory modulation disorder. Thank you. I, I, you know, I have another question here from Tracy um, that kind of relates. She said, my son went to OT weekly for two years when he was little and it helped. But now as a teen with ADHD, his sensory issues are now causing OCD type behavior. Do teen, and her question is, do teens benefit from OT at this point? Um, we are working with a neurologist, a psychiatrist, et cetera. Absolutely. We could all benefit from OT. Um, <laughs> OT is not just for children. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, the more I study and the more I learn and the more I practice, the more I personally learn from what I'm doing. And I have developed better coping skills myself for certain, you know, in response to certain things. Um, so, you know, I'm no teenager, but I am definitely in that older range um, and I am definitely benefiting from it. Um, the answer is yes, teenagers can. And I would say that what they will be, um, what, what the main focus and intervention would be, would be focusing on the main uh, focus of intervention would be to understand and acknowledge and be more self-aware um, of what they're sensitive to um, and develop, develop more coping or better coping skills on how to deal with it when those situations occur. And very often to anticipate it, if you know what those triggers may be, and you can anticipate those, anticipate those triggers and practice coping mechanisms or coping skills before you react, then you are setting yourself up for greater success when the experience comes and you normally would, would have a maladaptive time uh, dealing with it. You wouldn't be able to adjust or adapt. The practice and the awareness will really help um, teenagers. Um, uh, so Victoria uh, wrote me about her mother-in-law, Lorraine, who babysits three times a week and is, has a lot of concerns. Um, this is a child who's six years old, she was diagnosed with ADHD, executive function disorder and developmental coordination disorder last year. She's in an ICT classroom in a public school and she gets all related, ser related services. Um, the mom thinks she's got Asperger's but the neuropsychologist said no. Um, so I I'm gonna just take one or two of um, grandma's questions, Lorraine's questions. Um, one of them is the child will hit grandma. Grandma is the only person who experiences this and then apologize and say, I love you. So that's one thing that she's dealing with. Um, another, I'll give you the two that maybe are related. The child will ask the same question and then she'll make grandma repeat the answer. Um, do you have a way, I, I'll read them all and then you see if you have a way of understanding. The child will plan to go to the library or on another small trip, they have a planned, it all planned out what they're gonna do. Then while they're on their walk to the library, the child will change their mind, ask to go to the park or the store. And when she's told no, she gets upset and becomes defiant. Um, and the last thing is that the child will also say a lot of negative things. I wanna break X or I wanna see you bleed. And what they do is they try to ignore these comments and they just, th this, it's hard to understand what's going on. So I wonder if you have any insight. I, I could imagine, I could imagine that this experience um, happens often and could be very exasperating and frustrating. Um, it's very hard for me to answer that because I really don't know the pattern of this particular child's behavior and when these are, this is happening. It does sound like the first thing about the hitting and then saying, I love you sounds again, like, you know, at first glance, this is someone who is impulsive. Um, she's reacting to something. She might be excited about something and just, just reach out and hit something with whatever it is. Um, and then realize that she did the wrong thing and then apologize by saying, I love you or trying to make it better by saying that. Um, but some of the other experience, some of the other examples that you were giving may 
you know, maybe of indicative of someone who uh, has other issues other than SPD. There are a lot of comorbidities um, and there are a lot of overlapping uh, symptoms uh, and diagnoses. So it's a little hard for me to say, um, but I think that ignoring it is helpful for the short term, but understanding why you're ignoring it um, and that the ignoring might be a successful strategy um, in that moment, but I wouldn't encourage ignoring the behavior altogether. Um, and I think that it would be a good idea to um, follow up and try to understand and have someone help you understand what the pattern of this behavior looks like collectively and then taking a step back and trying to make sense of it. So I, I'm looking at the time, it's almost 20 after we're supposed to end at 9.15. And I know Deborah, this has been a very long day for you. Uh, so, um, and there's people who have to go and jump off and they're saying what a great talk it is and thank you so much. And thanks for the insightful information. So um, I think we're gonna end it here. Um, can people get in touch with you if they have absolutely uh, questions? Uh, I think yes. you put up your information earlier. I did. Um, I'm not sure how to share it again. Hold should on. I put you? So the your email is Deborah Goldberg OT yeah. at gmail.com. Yeah, here. There it is. Uh, here we go. There you go. Okay. That's my information. Please feel free to call. Um, I really welcome uh, people to come and ask me whatever they need to, um, feeling safe and um, without any pressure, um, really to try to understand and help their situations. It's, the sincerity is really real. <laughs> so please. Yeah, I know you want to help. You want to help. Yeah, people need help. And I, I get it, you know. And, and you've do, given, I think you professionally. I think you've given us a great framework into which to understand, you know, that it, it all, you know, you can see the same thing in this, the, the hyper, the hypo, um, in the same child, in, this, in ourselves. Yeah. Um, so it's not, even though you presented it as neat um, ways of understanding, you know, our brains and just aren't so neat in terms of how they exactly. respond to things. Um, exactly. I, you know, I just realized I didn't introduce myself. My name is Ellen Schwartz. Uh, I am the coordinator of the Bergen County chapter of CHAD. And I want to thank everyone who's here for coming. And, and I hope we see you again in the future. So with gratitude and thanks. And Deborah, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, terrific. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Good night. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Wait, wait. Let me just, oh, hi. I'm going to turn the recording off.